good morning and thanks for joining us today. Uh, good to see you all. Uh, so at Snohomish County, we're really continuing to focus on vaccinating as many of our residents as quickly and safely as possible. That's our priority. So in a minute, uh, Jason Beerman, our Director of Emergency Management, it will be providing details on how the storms across the United States have impacted vaccine supply and the continuing challenges we face with an unpredictable and inadequate supply of vaccines. It's really frustrating for all of us not to have more dependable supplies every week. It makes it difficult to plan, but we are optimistic it's going to get better with time and as the impacts from the storms diminish. So I want to make sure <clears throat> that our residents know that all groups that have been more adversely impacted by COVID-19, including our seniors, will remain priorities for us. So with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Spitters from the Snohomish Health District. Thank you, Executive Summers, and good morning, everyone. Uh, so we're continuing to see the case rate uh, decreasing, that two-week case rate that we follow. Uh, again, the number of cases per 100,000 residents in the 14 days uh, for the current period leading up through last Saturday, February 20, that had dropped down another notch uh, to 119. Uh, it was up at 142 up through the 13th of February, and you'll recall that it peaked at 440 in late December. So that's a 75% drop off of the peak and uh, just, uh, you know, continued progress in getting toward our goal. You know, our ultimate goal, of course, is zero, but uh, at least getting down below uh, 25 to 50 cases per 100,000 for two weeks. So we're on our way. Let's keep up the momentum. We've also seen a significant decline in the number of hospitalizations, deaths, and cases in long-term care facilities. Hospitalizations due to COVID have now been steady for a couple of weeks with 30 to 40 COVID cases in the hospital at any one time. And uh, the number of new hospitalizations uh, each week markedly reduced off the peak. There were just five residents who died from COVID in the week ending February 13. Uh, going back one month, we were averaging about 20 deaths per week, and going back two months, 30 deaths per week. So again, a much improved situation there. For the week ending February 13, there was just one newly reported case in a long-term care facility. That I find that truly remarkable. Compare that to late December and early January, where we were seeing 80 to 90 new cases each week. And at that time, virtually every skilled nursing facility in Snohomish County had one or more cases in the building within the prior several weeks. Now, only two of 17 skilled nursing facilities in Snohomish County have had a case in the building in the prior 28 days. It's just a remarkable improvement. And this decrease in nursing home cases offers much relief to the residents, their families, and to the staff, as well as to the healthcare system at large. There are several reasons contributing to the improvement, although it's hard to sort out how much is due to each factor. But certainly uh, the high transmission saturating the number of susceptible people, uh, especially among the residents, uh, and then leading to a decrease in the number of new infections that are even possible, that's certainly had a role. Improved infection prevention measures uh, as, as facilities encounter cases and learn from uh, uh, you know, learn from, from experience and counseling, and then certainly uh, not least would be the vaccination effort that's rolling out addressing uh, residents and staff of long-term care facilities and assisted living facilities, or of skilled nursing facilities and assisted living facilities. As that's gaining uh, momentum and coverage throughout the county, I think that the number of susceptibles in, in nursing homes is just reducing markedly, and that's why we're seeing uh, what we're seeing. On the vaccine front, I'd like to share some preliminary numbers and updates. Last week, again, more than 25,000 vaccine doses were administered in Snohomish County. We now have about 92,000 people who have received their first dose and 29,000 who are fully vaccinated. 
Combined together, that's more than 120,000 total COVID-19 vaccine doses that have been administered here in Snohomish County in just 10 weeks. There were shipment delays experienced nationwide because of winter weather in many parts of the country. However, those delayed shipments have started to arrive and we expect the remaining deliveries to come in the next day or two. On top of those deliveries from last week's uh, held up supplies, we'll also be receiving about 30,000 more vaccines for this week's uh, regularly scheduled shipments. Of those, about 10,000 are for first doses and 20,000 for second doses. Again, as we try to catch up on people who are coming up on their third or fourth week and are, are due for that second dose. These updated vaccine numbers will be posted on the Health District's COVID-19 vaccine website later this morning. As we have more vaccines coming in and more providers entering information, this is increasing the amount of time it takes for our staff to uh, prepare the data for presentation. Because of this, starting next week, we will begin publishing vaccine data on Thursdays rather than on Tuesdays as we have been doing up through today. The last quick update is on the launch of PrepMod. That's the new appointment system we've been discussing. The teams will be doing some beta testing for mobile clinics this week and next, and we plan to launch a broader, uh, we plan to launch the platform on a broader scale after that beta testing. To share more on the vaccine task force operations, I'll turn it over to Jason Behrman with the Department of Emergency Management. Jason. Thanks, Dr. Spinners, uh, Executive Summers. Good morning, everyone. Uh, two things I would like to talk about this morning, uh, and of course the first one is the mass vaccination effort. Um, but just to give folks a little bit of background, um, throughout this entire response, which is now over a year long, uh, we have seen a lot of evolving information, changing policies, uh, challenges with resources, um, which generally all sort of uh, leads to us having to adapt our operations um, and the vaccine work we're doing is no exception and, and Dr. Spitter has just mentioned some of the challenges. Um, as folks know, we convened the Snohomish County Vaccine Task Force back in July uh, at a time when we weren't sure which vaccine candidates would actually be approved, when for sure they would arrive in Snohomish County, or what the administration system and distribution systems would look like. Uh, we spent a lot of time initially talking about how uh, much of this could just go through our normal healthcare systems, uh, but fortunately we plan mass vaccination sites um, because we believed we would need them. Um, we didn't know when for sure, but we believed that we would need them. Um, and we knew absolutely that, that the goal to getting everyone in the county vaccinated as quickly and safely as possible was going to take more than just our existing healthcare system. Um, so we did a lot of planning around that. Uh, as soon as vaccines started arriving in the county in December, uh, we recognized that we were gonna have to help support the healthcare system pretty quickly. Uh, at that time, folks will remember we were in phase 1A, which was primarily healthcare settings, uh, healthcare workers, first responders in direct contact with potential COVID patients and folks working in long-term care facilities. Um, the next group for vaccination at that point had not even been determined uh, or defined by the state. So we were really work, you know, planning and working with a really small group of people. Um, now that we're in phase 1B1, that number of people is much larger. Uh, and so we've expanded from one site to now four sites, a walk-in site at the Boeing Activity Center in Everett and drive-through sites in Edmonds, Monroe and Arlington. It's also important to note that we have teams that are going out uh, into our community to vaccinate at adult family homes. And we're in the process of planning additional community-based clinics to help serve some of our uh, marginalized populations uh, throughout the county. So with all that background and all that pre-work that was done, uh, I just wanna say there's, there's, been, um, there's been a lot of success. Um, Dr. Spitters mentioned the overall number of folks who've been vaccinated. About half of those folks have been have received their first dose at one of our mass vaccination sites. Um, we know we're still a long ways off from getting the, the over 600,000 Snohomish County residents that we know will want to be vaccinated, actually completely vaccinated, but we're making good progress. Uh, our long-term care facilities, staff and residents are getting vaccinated through a combination of 
a federal pharmacy program uh, and our mobile uh, uh, resources that we've done in partnership with our fire and EMS teams, along with private providers and those who make it to our mass vaccination sites. Um, in Snohomish County right now, all 18 of our skilled nursing facilities and our 46 assisted living facilities have had on-site vaccination clinics. And of the 615 adult family homes in our county, we believe by next week, at least the first dose will, be ha will have been administrated in all 615 of those settings. That's a pretty big accomplishment in a pretty short amount of time. Uh, Dr. Spitters mentioned some of the challenges. Um, we have been focused for the last couple of weeks on getting information out to folks about getting their second dose. The state has really emphasized um, uh, folks getting their second doses. We are working to launch a new registration system called PrepMod, which he mentioned, uh, and that we, we believe is going to vastly improve folks' ability to sign up for first and then get signed up for second doses. We've done work to make sure that we have consistent times for when appointments get posted, consistent times for when our clinics are, are open and operational. Um, and we're also expanding staffing and, and capacity at our call center. So folks who have questions, uh, who may need help in other languages and or are just unable to register online because of, of technology challenges, uh, we're expanding the capacity so that you have a number where you can call in and get assistance from us. Uh, we know there have been other hurdles. Um, this is an operation at a scale that, that we haven't done, quite frankly, in terms of vaccines. Uh, I think Dr. Spitters maybe would even say probably since the last large pandemic back in the early 1900s. Um, we have partners working at every level of government. We have policies that impact us at every level of government. Um, and so no matter how much we planned, and we planned quite a bit, um, there are things outside of our control and things that have happened that we couldn't predict. Uh, first and foremost, as folks have heard me say, and I think uh, both the executive and Dr. Spitters, uh, is vaccine availability and a predictable vaccine supply. That has been our biggest challenge. Um, how much vaccine comes into the county drives how many sites we have open. It drives how many staff work at those sites. It drives how many auxiliary staff are needed to support them. And sometimes that literally changes day to day. Um, we're really grateful to our partners for their flexibility and, and ask the patients of the public uh, and hope that they understand that uh, outside of our control is, uh, is sometimes how we have to react to um, uh, our ability to have some of these sites open or closed. Uh, the weather has played a part. Uh, we've had weather delays with vaccine shipments in the last week, which has led to most of what would have been week 10, which was last week's allocation, and now arriving at the same time with week 11. Uh, that means essentially we went from last week, a fairly low number that Dr. Spitters mentioned, to a large number of vaccines in the county. To get ready for that, we are prepared to, uh, for example, at our Arlington site to up capacity uh, for the next few days to 1,700 appointments per day. Uh, and by the end of the week to have the capacity potentially even up to 3,000 folks per day. Um, that's a lot of folks going through. It requires a lot of staffing, a lot of coordination with the local jurisdiction, and again, a lot of patience as people go through the system. Um, I will say that from the beginning, I mentioned appointments, uh, not doses. Uh, we did make a decision early on that we would only open appointments when we had vaccine available, and that has been a hurdle for many people. We know that is frustrating. Um, again, that's based on supply. We only make vaccine appointments available when we actually have vaccine in hand. Um, we know there have been some issues with the way uh, the phasing has been set up and the prioritization. Um, we ask that folks please do wait for your phase. Um, if you see that you might be eligible to register or, or you see the opportunity to register for an appointment, but then you realize that you're not eligible, um, please save that appointment for someone is and share the information so that they can get their, their appointment set up. And if they do need help finding an appointment or signing up, please have them contact the call center. Um, among all of that, uh, you know, the last couple of things I just want to touch on, I mentioned the weather. We've had wind blow over tents at our sites and staff scrambling in the middle of the night to, re to set those tents back up and resume operations in the morning. Um, the snow has played an impact, uh, not just nationally on getting vaccine here, but in, in our need to shut down sites. 
and we've also had, and, and many folks have heard throughout throughout the nation, uh, some of the rumors and misinformation that has gone out. Uh, we've had folks that I believe are, are well-meaning who have shared uh, links to our vaccination appointment sites, uh, sometimes communicating that they are first come, first serve. Uh, our vaccination sites are not first come, first serve. They are by appointment only. Um, and when we have folks who, who either show up without appointments or overload the system and they're not eligible, that causes concerns for us and slows down our process. Uh, we've also heard concerns about folks who are getting vaccinated outside of the eligibility scope. Um, that's not unique to us. That's not unique to uh, the state. That's not unique to the country. Uh, it is something that we are working diligently to address. Uh, we have trainings and briefings for all the staff and volunteers. We require folks who make their appointments to attest that when they make the appointment that they are actually eligible. And we do check their IDs on site. Uh, we've, we've done a lot more outreach to try and let folks know uh, that the sites are appointment only. Uh, and we're continuing to de develop and refine our processes for reaching out to folks who are eligible. So bottom line, um, it, it's a lot of very complicated work, complex work happening in a very short period of time uh, in the middle of a pandemic. Um, we're aware that everything has not gone perfectly, um, but we feel that the amount of progress we're making is, is quite good um, when we look at where we were just a couple of short months ago with uh, vaccines just having come into the county a couple of short months ago. And the last thing, and I apologize for taking up the time, but I, I, I felt I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, from my team and from the emergency management uh, community around the county, in addition to the vaccines, we are continuing to provide PPE. Uh, we provided PPE to over 8 million pieces of PPE uh, to over 570 different agencies. Uh, we've continued our partnership with strong partners like uh, Snow Isle Libraries to get uh, right now over 800,000 face coverings out into the community. We've distributed uh, business kits, about 2,500 of those out to our small business partners. Uh, and we are still continuing to run Nourishing Neighborhoods, which has provided over 11,000 boxes of food to some of our most in need families partnered with the Boys and Girls Clubs to provide uh, over two and a half million meals and over a million snacks to kids that are there at the Boys and Girls Club, a million dollars in support to uh, the school programs, and of course the ongoing work at the isolation and quarantine site uh, where they have so far uh, been able to safely isolate or quarantine over 300 county residents and make sure they had a place. Uh, to be while they were waiting to either determine that they were going to be diagnosed with COVID-19 or to make sure that they weren't out in the community and inadvertently transmitting. So uh, I apologize, uh, Executive Summers, Dr. Spitters, I ran a little bit long, but there was a lot to cover. Uh, thank you so much for your time, and I'll turn it back over to you, Executive Summers. No, that was great, Jason. Thank you so much. Uh, first question is, one of the metrics used to show progress on vaccinations is the rate of inoculations per 10,000 people. Snohomish County has consistently lagged behind most other counties, all the other large counties. Uh, why is that happening? And I'll just kick it off uh, and, and stand to be corrected, but supply, supply, supply has been the issue for us. We have had the capacity to deliver inoculations that far exceeds the amount of vaccine that we have. And also early on, it was clear that we were getting um, uh, fewer doses than some other counties around the state. And we uh, complained about that. And I think that's largely been corrected. But uh, any, any other uh, points, Jason or Dr. Spitters, you'd like to add to that or uh, correct what I said? Well, uh, Executive Summers, I, I just, uh... I, I agree with what you've said, and I would just add that you know that's not all. Um, not all of our low allocation early was um, you know some unfairness. It certainly was uh, dissatisfying. But we per capita, you know, King County, Pierce County have a lot more healthcare providers, and I think you know the long-term care facilities, that sort of thing. So in that one A group. Uh, we just have a smaller population as a percentage of the total population. So we kind of fell behind in our allocations in part due to that, although uh, that didn't stop us from, you know, uh, being the squeaky wheel and trying to make sure that we're catching up. And I, I, as Executive Summer said, I think that things are improving and 
So uh, hopefully uh, do much better as we go forward. The one other thing I'd add is, you know, we're in a, in a race and a competition against the virus, not against the neighbors. So that's, you know, I have to admit, I had to look it up when you asked the question. Our real focus is on getting the people in Snohomish County taken care of as quickly as we can through the measures that Jason and his team are, are putting together. And, and our, we're meanwhile doing all of our other uh, containment efforts. So uh, this is no simple task, and uh, but we're really focused on Snohomish County and moving us forward as fast as we can. Anything to add to that, Jason? No, thank you. You, covered, you both covered it real well. Okay. So uh, based on the data, uh, Dr. Spitter, do you believe folks took your advice and played it safe on Super Bowl Sunday? Well, uh, I don't know the reason. I don't know if it was my advice or just their own good, good uh, uh, rational thought, uh, or maybe we got lucky. But uh, I, I do think that that there was no impact of the no negative impact of the Super Bowl uh, on case rates, and so that's a great, great thing. I'm thankful to the community for that, and I think they, you know, collectively we made a good choice as to how to enjoy that game and. Uh, uh, hopefully, we'll continue to do that with like uh, temptations as time passes. Okay, one for Jason. Uh, can you elaborate on the marginalized communities that the county will be trying to reach? Which communities are these, and will the county be using smaller pop-up clinics to target these groups? Yeah, so the marginalized communities, uh, we do know there are BIPOC communities uh, that have been um, uh, disproportionately affected by COVID-19 in terms of uh, their impacts. Uh, so Executive Summers, uh, along with some others, reached out uh, and we had a forum with a number of these groups, um, including the NAACP, uh, C3, uh, members of the Latinx community, uh, a large number of groups to hear from them, their concerns. Um, so we're doing that and working in close partnership with both the health district and the executive's office of social justice. Um, we, uh, I will say we are not using the term pop-up clinics. Uh, we're using community-based clinics. We don't want to give the impression, and this was based partly on their feedback, that uh, these will be sort of surprise events that folks will just, will suddenly show up and uh, anyone who's around can suddenly uh, get the vaccine. Um, we are trying to work with that closely with them to plan uh, community-based uh, in um, clinics uh, with folks who are within the eligibility criteria uh, but may have mobility challenges or other issues and so that we can bring um, vaccines to them uh, in a planned way so I just did want to mention that uh, these are not pop-up clinics okay I'll just add that uh, based on the work we did during the census, we know that uh, there are communities uh, throughout the county that might have access problems. It could be access to the internet. It could be uh, cultural issues, lack of uh, uh, access, you know, internet in the home. Uh, and there's some social issues, um, cultural issues uh, that need to be addressed. So what we're doing is communicating with those groups and asking them, how, how can we best get out to your community and let them know when they're eligible and uh, when vaccines are available to them. So uh, we're staying within the groups uh, that the states set, the age groups and other uh, vulnerability groups. So we're not going outside of that, but we are communicating, especially to make sure that everybody knows about the vaccine, its safety, and we're working with them to uh, make sure that they have access to the vaccine. Um, next question <clears throat> is originally Jason said the new scheduling system would launch last week. Then Dr. Spitter said it would likely be this week. Now it looks like it could be next week or even longer. What's causing the holdup? Yeah, I'll, I'll address that one, uh, Dave. Um, well, there are a number of things. Uh, one is access. Um, so the system requires access for all the different sites. So we have to, there's an administrative piece of loading things in, having the right folks identified to provide the inputs. Uh, and then there's a training component uh, where folks have to be trained to use the system uh, to make sure they're using it correctly. Uh, sort of bottom line, I would say, um, 
uh, we know the system we have in place right now is not perfect, um, but folks have already been using it. And we wanted this rollout to be uh, a, a, a notable improvement. So we're trying to make sure that we have everything tied down in terms of training, uh, the technology that has to be in place both out at the sites uh, and the QA, QC pieces where we can look at things and make sure they're getting uploaded properly. We wanted to have all of that in place. I know that that means we're still using the same system uh, that we had been using. And again, we recognize that that system is not, is not perfect, but we really were committed to this one being markedly better. Uh, and so we're just taking the time to make sure that it actually is when we roll it out. It, Jason, <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong, but prep mod is a state system. So this is something the state has developed and is pushing out to uh, counties and other jurisdictions. It is. And so part of that rollout also means that we are in line with lots of others who are trying to roll out. Um, and so the states, they're, uh, they're able, their ability to assist is stretched a bit as well. Um, so yeah, there's, it's uh, lots of folks trying to get prep mod into, into action at the same time we are. You have anything to add, Doctor? Okay. All right. <clears throat> Can you tell us more about the special education K six special education staff, in addition to the K two grade students and on site staff? What are you hoping to learn from it, and how will you use the information gathered? Uh, I confess to not being uh, certain what what you you mean by the special education K through six, but you know certainly uh, I'll just speak to the overarching uh, strategy for safely uh, you know getting students back into school, and that's to uh, serve the neediest students first. That that would include uh, kids with uh, intellectual, physical, or mental health issues that require face-to-face -face, uh, teaching where remote learning is not gonna help. And that's regardless of any age. And that's been, you know, we've green lighted that back from the beginning, whether the student is five years old or 15. And then to layer in uh, 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 cohorted groups, you know, 50-50 kind of on campus, off campus uh, over time, starting with that K through too, but working on up through elementary. And now our case rates countywide are such that when schools arrive to the point where they've uh, slid back in all of their elementary school students, they could look at moving on into middle and high school if uh, case rates continue to be stable or declining. So Overall, I'm optimistic uh, based on our experience thus far that cases do occur and continue to occur in schools, but the transmission is unusual and widespread transmission we haven't seen at all. And that matches the, uh, the reports of others from around the uh, state, country and world. So uh, we, we have cautious but uh, um, forthright optimism in, in the schools moving ahead with that plan. So apparently that question was referring to the <clears throat> Snohomish School District's participation in a testing study with the UW. So uh, we've directed her to uh, contact them about that study. That's right. Yeah, UW and they are, have gotten together for a testing study and uh, uh, that's, that's great. Uh, you know, we will learn something about transmission. Uh, I suspect it will reinforce what we already know is that cases will occur in schools, but that ongoing transmission in school settings will be unusual. Okay, uh, has the health district started getting multi-week vaccine forecasts from the state? And if so, will that information be made public and any idea how many doses are going to be at the mass sites this week? Uh, no, nothing at county level. Uh, we've only seen statewide uh, uh, forecasts, and I think those come out in press releases. So I believe you will have seen those. If if not, we can get those forwarded to you. Um, uh, that, that's public information that came out last week. Okay. Um, seniors are growing increasingly frustrated and feel left behind. You've mentioned this new scheduling system that will create a wait list and make things easier. Can you explain how this will work and specifically how I could make things easier for seniors? Okay. 
Well, I think the idea is that those that uh, call call in uh, can have someone on our uh, our hotline, our COVID nineteen hotline, help them register. Uh, so it, still, the only way to register is through the internet, but we can assist them uh, through the telephone. Uh, and we're also working with some uh, 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 non-governmental organizations uh, and, and 501c3s, I think, that, that work with older residents of the county to try to address this, this uh, challenge as well. But that's an, an ongoing piece of work. But the basic idea is that they can call in and get registered and uh, over the phone and if there are no spots available they can get on a waiting list that then is becomes a call list when when future doses open up um, and then also I would just mention you know as well you know those uh, sort of government and civil society efforts to to try to make it easier for our older residents who are not uh, technology savvy or technology fluent can also be augmented by, you know, personal individual level efforts in neighborhoods, families, et cetera, and trying to help our elders, you know, get connected and, and doing some of that work for them as well as friends, family members, neighbors, et cetera. Uh, that's something we can all do at the individual level while our government and non-government uh, uh, efforts uh, forge ahead. Uh, given that we're getting the hospital system and most vulnerable populations vaccinated, do you think it's likely that the previous wave was the largest we'll experience of the pandemic, at least in terms of hospitalizations and deaths? In the short term, sure. Uh, long term, uh, I'm, I'm reluctant to make any long term uh, uh, predictions about this virus and our experience with it. But I think that with the continued uh, prevention efforts that we're all taking, uh, reference the Super Bowl comments earlier, and as we, uh, we try to roll out this vaccine, you know, it's really a, a, a race. We're trying, to, we're trying to get as many people vaccinated before the next wave might occur. And so, uh, you know, we, we all got to keep doing our part. Uh, Jason mentioned opening up more appointments at mass vaccination sites. What else are you doing to prepare for this higher volume this week? And are you fully confident you'll be able to distribute the entire allocation in this short period of time? Jason? Yeah, so in addition to expanding capacity, we're actually expanding days. So we're anticipating some of the sites are going to be open through the weekend. Um, so just based on the throughput, uh, that we have available to us. We're, we're pretty comfortable. Uh, if folks are signing up and showing up, we'll be able to get them through. Um, I know I mentioned on one of the earlier calls uh, availabilities, we do have a, a, a significant amount of throughput capacity that we're, that we're really not using yet because we don't have enough vaccines. So uh, we're, we're confident we can expand up uh, and, and put this out into the community. Um, and then we still have additional capacity when we have more vaccine. So in short, we don't have any concerns that we'll be able to get the vaccine out if, if we receive it. Um, any update on the vaccine equity data the health district requested from the state? Yeah, we're, uh, you know, that, that database is, uh, is a challenge for uh, uh, statisticians and epidemiologists to work with just because the, when you've got so many different people entering data, it's, uh, it takes a lot of, um, you know, cleaning, we call it in, in the epidemiology world. That, that doesn't mean we're scrubbing or laundering it. It means we're, you know, uh, Mount Lake Terrace ends up entered 15 different ways and you got to, figure out how to make that analyzable. You've got to clean that up. And so our team was working on that data set last week and we should have something that's uh, publicly visible uh, by the end of the week or early next week to share. And then we'd, we'd probably repeat that effort uh, monthly. It's such a substantial effort to take in that huge database, clean it, you know, so that it's analyzable and then presentable. Uh, that, you know, doing it more often than weekly is going to be a misallocation of, of efforts. But we'll get something out toward the end of this week, early next week, and then about monthly thereafter. 
Okay, regarding the challenge to scheduling two doses for each patient, how long in between shots before the vaccine is considered ineffective? No one knows. Uh, we know that you know efficacy really picks up about seven to 14 days after the dose. You really see the, the experience of people who got the vaccine and those who got the placebo separating with the placebo folks continuing to get cases and the vaccinated folks stopping getting cases right around 14 days. But how long that lasts, uh, only time will tell. Uh, I, I would say, I'll, again, although I, you know, not uh, shy away from predicting the future, I would not be surprised that if we need periodic, annual, or thereabouts uh, boosters uh, for COVID-19, uh, based on either waning immunity or uh, changes in strains that are circulating, much like we experience with influenza vaccination yearly. I, I would not be surprised if that's in our long-term future, but uh, time will tell and nobody knows right now. Yeah, for st <clears throat> storage of vaccines, how long before a single vaccine vial is ineffective or expired? Well, it, it depends on the product and the temperature at which it's being stored. But the ones that are frozen, you know, in the, the minus 70, uh, or, or which is the Pfizer or the Moderna stored at minus 20, those are good for months and months stored at that temperature. Once you bring them out and uh, uh, thaw them and start using them, you've got just the rest of the day. To use it. Whatever is not used up by the rest of the day has to go in the garbage. So um, hope that helps. Great. I think that does it. I, thanks everybody for your questions. There's a link also in the chat box to the Department of Health uh, information about the three-week outlook for vaccine distribution. So uh, there is that link for your use. Thank you. This is Kristen in the Joint Information Center. Thank you again for joining us today and for your questions. We're going to wrap up. Please stay tuned for future media availabilities.